Gemini. And so usually I like to ask the question, think about random things, beach or mountains, book or movies. But I let Gemini ask the questions. So we're, we're going to kind of start there, see how it all goes. Okay, so first Be question. Nice. Uh, Gemini is incredible. Okay. And I think, I think you're going to feel good about this. Um, okay, so we gave Gemini your bio, your background, and what they came back with is uh, storyboards or napkin sketches. General storyboards. Okay. Uh, 2D or 3D animation? Both. <laughs> okay. Uh, technical expertise or artistic vision? You can't say both. <laughs> you can. I, I always say both. <laughs> you sound like a marketer, so. But you're right. Everybody's right. Okay. <laughs> Except for a few people are wrong. That's right. I do have opinions. <laughs> so you like artistic and technical balanced? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, focusing on the process or the final product? Uh, I would actually say more focused on the product. Excuse me. The process. The process. Yeah, that, that actually is a, a, yeah, that's a yes on the process. Okay. Uh, taking a big risk or playing it safe? What does it mean to play it safe? Like... You know what? What does it mean to play it safe? I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the answer. Taking a big risk. What is your favorite coding language? C. Okay. <laughs> C fans out here. Okay, the last two that Jim and I came up with, I think, are my favorite. Woody or Buzz Lightyear? Uh, I would say Woody. Okay. I would definitely say Woody. Tell us why. Um, he's less deluded. <laughs> well, a little deluded, or a lot deluded. He, seems, he falls into that all deluded. Okay, I love it. And then time travel. If you could choose, would you go back in the day, or would you go into the future? Well, back in the day. Well, there's certainly questions about the past that I wish I could see. Mm. Um, but I think if I went into the future, well, first of all, you realize we're going into the future at the speed of light. Yes. Right? It's a little hard to go faster than that. That's right. That's right. And it, it was pretty amazing in our, I got to have a couple of conversations with Ed in preparation for this. And you did such an incredible job framing exactly what you just said, which is what it's like to embrace speeding into the future. And I, you know, we'll talk about some of your accolades. I just have to say again, when you read things um, about the things you've accomplished in the chapters of your career, they're astounding. So we talked about Pixar, co-founding Pixar. We talked about Walt Disney Animation and Pixar. We talked about the Turing Award winner um, for three-dimensional computer graphics, which is massive. But just, you know, at the most base level, you are a computer graphics pioneer. You have had five Academy Awards, uh, including Oscar of Lifetime Achievement. You have written a book. I mean, so for five Oscars, woo, I just have to. <laughs> and so the conversation we're having today is around storytelling through the lens of AI. So that's technically what we're here to talk about. But it is so rare to talk to such an icon and really inspire an audience that um, are really, you know, aspiring to be and do whatever are in your journeys. So I would love to balance the conversation both with AI and just Ed and the journey and the learnings and the lessons you've had as being a creator and a leader of many, many people, if that's okay with you. Okay, so starting with AI and how we're thinking about reframing creativity. You know, generative AI um, within the creative community can be somewhat polarizing. So let's just like say the thing in the room that we all know to be true. When you think about how you have pioneered over the course of time, embracing things like going from 2D to 3D, you have embraced change um, beautifully. And so as generative AI continues to speed into the space of creativity, how are you thinking about it? How are you counseling other leaders within the industry to think about it? And how should this team uh, kind of frame it in their minds? Well, I, I should say incidentally, in, com in computer science, my very first two teachers later received Turing Awards for different reasons. One was Alan Kay, who sort of just 
in a start to be on for this concept of things you're going to change in an accelerating rate, an exponential rate. In the other was Ivan Sutherland, <coughs> who said, in the scope of a grand vision, you go a step at a time. Mm. And, and for me, it was like, okay, you, you hold this line thing because you're going to change very rapidly. And you take the next step and you participate in that step. Uh, now, this, there's been this drumbeat of exponential speed for an astonishing 50 years, and it's continuing. Um, but the, it's been true for the entire industry. Um, and that's, I mean, for me, it's rather remarkable. But what's remarkable is the number of people who are in the business who didn't recognize the implications of the rate of change. So, if something is going to change rapidly, which we saw in graphics or filmmaking, but in industry after industry, even if people, like in the computer industry, where they were in the business that was dependent upon that, that rate of change, most of the executives could not understand the implication of that change. So the natural tendency for a lot of them was to protect the existing business model. I know why, and I understand it, you, gotta, you have to make money, but when it's changing that rapidly, uh, at, at an exponential rate, you are going to be affected. And if you say you don't want it, like Kodak did with digital cameras, they were the first ones that made a digital camera. They didn't like the business model, so they rejected it, all right? So over and over again, we don't like what's going to happen, but it doesn't matter. It's going to happen, so can we participate in it? Are we part of that change? And because that itself is a creative activity. It's like, okay, okay you, yes, you need those things to work. I understand that. If you're going to change. Are we part of it? I love that. Um, something else you said is, I, I asked what's he doing now that he is technically retired um, and living a good life. And what he said was, he's busier than ever. Um, and both with your children and grandchildren, which is an incredible part of life, but also you're still in the business. So when you're talking to some of the most powerful creative executives, um, film executives, leaders in industry, to your point on embracing change, how do you, are you counseling them to today? And what are the kinds of things you're telling them to get them moving forward that if anyone in this room has the same kind of apprehension, maybe they could take into their day-to-day -day life? Well, I, I do understand the apprehension. I understand why people are worried about it because they don't really know what it's going to mean for them. And that's a justifiable concern. What does this mean? And there are two kinds of reaction. One is, is this new stuff even relevant to me? Um, and the other one is, what does it mean for my raising, uh, supporting my family, or, and so forth. Uh, so there are justifiable things to think about. Part of that equation needs to be that, well, okay, since things are going to change, what do we do about it? And um, while I can look back in you know, 50 years of rabbit holes of uh, even examples of that, if I look at it today, it's, it's pretty clear that we're going through a fairly dramatic change because it isn't like we're starting an exponential process. We're in one and on a fairly steep part of the curve. So what do we do? And, and, and like it's, and it's always been true, is you don't copy what you did in the past. In fact, you can't copy what you did in the past. It's not really an option. So how do we use these new, uh, new technology, not just for you know, you know, entertainment or, uh, or writing or something like that, or it's just how do we help solve some serious problems in the world? We all know that there. I think, mean, like, you as a group would care about what's happening, but what should you do? That's the hard question. I actually don't have the answer to that, other than the fact that, to, you know, basically have a set of values and then use those as a core 
to move forward to solve problems. To run a mentor, um, I think is quite powerful. And you know, I, I have a old leader that used to tell me the only thing that can get you fired is doing the same thing you did last year again. And so the idea of embracing change is so true, whether you're a developer, an executive, in any walk of life. So that, that tidbit is something I think everyone in this room is grateful to hear from you. I want to talk a little bit about creativity and leadership. Um, you know, if you look at your journey, and we even talked about Lucasfilm, so you can go as far back as you'd like and, and go to today. It, it feels like the idea and the life of being a developer is very much entrepreneurial. Googlers are very entrepreneurial in how we look at our day-to-day -day lives and experiences. And being entrepreneurial is about taking an idea and bringing it to life through the lens of a, like a thinking like a founder kind of mentality, but driving it into a business. So from the beginning of your career to now leading huge teams and, and projects and revenue, how did you keep the founder's mindset through it all? How did you keep that challenger mentality that, that you started with? Well, uh, part of that was to hang on to the very notion that we we always have to do something new, and that uh, trying to settle into something um, is a problem. It, it, it's like if you think about it, there's a series of things you go through. You've got an idea, you develop it, you convince people it's good, you begin to build a team, um, you develop the skills, but it's also building teams around you for marketing and getting it out there. And, and, uh, and, and I have to say in all this is to ensure that you don't end up with a, uh, a class system. I've seen this in a lot of companies. The people that came up with the ideas are first class, other people as you know, the supporters are the second class. And, and, and I understood early on that that was a very bad idea. That there needs to be this respect. Now, building this team, at some point you like to settle into, oh, this is working, we're doing very well. That's the danger point. Uh, people have mastered a craft, they've got it going, and then they can pay attention to other things. So, the, the mindset of uh, being an entrepreneur is that, okay, you, you have to remember what started that <clears throat> because that starting point is always happening again over and over. If you don't do it, someone else will. Yep. And I know, I mean, you know there was that book from many years ago which was The Innovator's Dilemma, but fundamentally it's, it's how do you actually get something to work at the same time do that little thing that started it. So it's like you get to the point where it works and then you get stuck. Over and over again coming through that, they get stuck. Uh, okay, that's not a good place to be. Yeah. And uh, so which means the measure of the new ideas um, where you don't really know where they're going is such that you have to allow for, in any company, new things to start, new ideas to happen, make room for them, they won't all work. You know, they never have all work. I, I, so, two things. One, first of all, I have all these questions and I'm starting to veer off the path already, so sorry, but you're saying so many good things, I just want to capitalize on them. One team mentality is special. So basically, you're saying there was like an A and a B class. Big idea thinkers got separated versus kind of the doers. And having a one team mentality as an entrepreneur um, is something incredible, but as a leader of many people, I'm sure your team is felt on the level playing field, which is special and rare when you think about, you know, what is corporate America. So, so thank you for sharing that, you know, The other thing you said around, you can come up with a thousand ideas and, you know, maybe 10 hit, and understanding that you always have to be moving forward and ideating is critical. I just want to ask a question on how do you come up with an idea? So, how, like, the things you have created didn't exist before you created them. And so what is the mind space you put yourself in in creation and ideating? How do you, how do you think about that? Well, um, what we have done is, is, is to, to ensure there are people who come up with 
something, and it's based upon finding the right people. Uh, looking for people who've got the right openness and mindset, and not judging the idea. Let's go back to the first question you asked is, um, if, you, if you have the right people, they'll come up with something, right? I, I couldn't have thought of all these things. Um, it, it's the one thing I know fairly strongly is that, um, you know, I, I can never be raised in another culture, I can't be another gender, I can't be another ethnicity. Um, there are experiences I cannot have. But I can have the faith that people bring something of great value to what we're doing. And, and that is a faith in humanity. It's like, you know, I, you know. So I, and for me, that's what, what faith means, and it's not a term that we typically use in business, but it's like, okay, if I think I'm supposed to know the answer as a leader, then I really screw things up. But if somebody comes in and they've got something, you know, they, they might be wrong, they might be right. Yeah. How the hell would I know? <laughs> if I believe that they're good people, then they're gonna do something which is cool. We love meeting, so there are mostly developers in this audience. And uh, developers are skilled at, you know, identifying an idea and refining and improving that idea. You just talked about this, but I'm curious, like, how do you take an idea from good to great, and then how do you know when to just cut bait? Is it something that's gut? Is it data and gut? How do you think about that? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Refining an idea. So if you have an idea that's maybe mediocre, but you think you can improve it from kind of a good idea to great versus when you see an idea and you know like that's not it is it gut that helps you get to that decision is it data and gut how, how do you refine or cut bait well if, if i take this the notion of like a, a bad idea to a good idea and a good idea to a great idea i actually think of them in two different ways the bad idea the good idea is solely dependent upon the team and so the focus is, how do you get a really good team? Because they're gonna come up with a good idea. They'll either they'll chuck the thing that's bad and they'll replace it with something else. And you have to let them do that. Yeah. Now, if they've got a good idea, then the question is how do you get to be a great idea? That has to do with how that team interacts with each other. And, and this is an iterative process, and a good iterative process in which one doesn't think about something whether something is fails or really good so forth. It's really like, does it work? Yeah. If it doesn't work, that's not a failure. But even think it that way. We, we don't really use the terminology of failure at, at Pixar. Other than the fact that once in a while there is a massive screw up. <laughs> it does happen. Yep. But we don't let that terminology of failure. In fact, the iterative process, because in the iterative process, you put something up, it doesn't work, okay, let's try this, let's try this. It's just thought of as an iterative process. Yeah. And what you want is a mindset within the group where you are iterating, but you're removing the judging part of it, and you don't become attached to your idea. If you throw out an idea, it doesn't work, that's not a judgment on you, yeah. and so, which means you don't want to apply judgment to other people. If you do that, then you kind of free them up to uh, generate all kinds of new ideas. And it's rather amazing to watch when it happens. And sometimes it doesn't happen. So the questions I have. So to, uh, there's one I, I just want you to tell the story because I was blown away. And then the second, I'm just going to ask what your most defining moment in your career was. But before I get to that question, you shared uh, your journey, which we're used to upward trajectory. We never feel good when it's horizontal or downward trajectory, like, and, which I disagree with, but that sometimes happens. You shared that Steve Jobs demoted you three times. No, he only demoted me twice. Okay, twice. So I was president three times, okay. which meant I was unmade president twice. <laughs> that is epic. Okay, so what I love, what was that journey like? How did you stay on the path, and what did you learn? Well, the, uh, when Pixar started, I was the president. And, uh, and the truth was, none of us knew what the hell we were doing. 
And Steve actually never worked for the high-end product before, which we're selling. And uh, so, because we we're manufacturing at some point, he said, you know, Ed, you don't really have the skills to do this. Now, the thing was, it didn't matter what he said, I still had this long-range goal, so I wasn't going to let something like getting demoted from the position derail me. I wasn't happy about it, but, you know, I was still there in the position in the, in the world of country, but somebody else was running as president. Very nice guy. Um, Perfectly wonderful. Pardon? Yep, wonderful guy. Yeah, wonderful guy. But <laughs> the, we weren't making it as a manufacturing company. It was very educational. I learned a lot, and I enjoyed learning there. But then we switched over to Pure Software, and then I was back being the president again. Um, so then we were uh, now selling software, making commercials, and we're trying to reach the tour goal. And then we get this contract with Disney to make a film, and we're getting close to making Toy Story. And Steve said, well, you know, you have really the right material to be the CEO of a public company. So, um, you know, I wasn't super thrilled about that. But the thing was, in both times, I actually knew he was right. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, then I started a different role, and then we went public, and then after a, a, a while, we reorganized, he had me, he said, okay, now you're ready to be the president. So now I was the president for the third time. Well, this time, he announced in front of the company, and the people that were saying, I thought he was always the president. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, nobody really cared. Yeah. Uh, but it was, and, the, and the, the thing was, there was always truth in that. Steve was very good about speaking the truth, and uh, it was one of his superpowers, is, is he had a way of getting to the truth. Uh, you know, he wasn't a very graceful at the beginning of his career. <laughs> but what most people don't know is that in the years of 91 to 95, he changed. And after he changed, nobody would talk, psychoanalyze him while he was still alive. Mm. Which is why that story was was missed, and those people stayed with him for, for the rest of his life. So, um, I uh, what I found when we were a public company was that he fired two members of the board of directors of Pixar because they never disagreed. And uh, his style of interacting with the people at Apple was very different than my style of interacting with the people at at, uh, at Pixar. The, the, it was fine with him. The point was, how do you actually get to insight and understanding? That's what it's about. How do you do that? Every group is different. But if your position, all that stuff doesn't matter. It's how do you get to solve the problem? How do you get insight? How do you get the team? Is your defining mentor or leader within your career to make you and take you to where you evolved to? Well, I would say the defining was at the beginning or at the University of Utah. Uh, as I mentioned, my first two teachers were Turing Award winners. But I would say the defining thing, I want to say mentors, part of the big mentor was they created the environment. And when I left, after four years in graduate school, I just looked back and said, I love this, this is a great experience. And I, I just said, I want to have this kind of environment with me for the rest of my life. And then it was a journey of discovering what that environment needs to be. I made a bunch of mistakes along the way, but it was essentially that start of understanding that this is it's that culture and that environment that's going to work. Uh, it was an amazing group of people because we were all affected by it. Jim Clark from Silicon Graphics, John Warnock, Alan Kay, holy cow. But they're a product of a culture. Of openness, sharing, and, and honesty, and pushing. I love that. Finding moment in your career? Um, well, I, honestly, I, when I, as I look back on it, it's actually was retiring. I thought, well, I went through actually eight phases in my career. Mm -hmm. um, they got shorter over time. It was 20 years to get the Toy Story. Uh, to find the culture at Pixar, but each one was a, a journey for me. It was always, it's always interesting. Like I, I thought of myself originally as a researcher and programmer, uh, and, and well, I was a, a originally a 
charge of this uh, research group back in New York, New York Tech. Um, didn't really want to manage, so I had some my theories about how to manage were just a crock. Um, but what I found though as I was doing this is like, you know, getting the best out of people is a really interesting problem. And I wouldn't describe it as, I didn't think of it at the time as a challenging one, but it was interesting. And then slowly over time it became, uh, without losing my love of for the technology, but it became a love is to figure out, oh, you, make, you can have people do better, then that's a huge win. I, I love that. I have one more for you before we do. What do you want your legacy to be? Uh, my, I would like my legacy to be that uh, I've had a good impact on people. Yeah. That the group has continued. I think without a doubt, you can answer that question, yes, of being a good leader of people and understanding and tapping into the humanity that exists and getting people encouraged to always do and be better. Um, so so we are, we're, we're honored for you to be here, but we're also thankful for that journey and that that is what